All right, so welcome everyone to this session where we're going to be discussing the state of diversity and inclusion at the Apache Silver Foundation. So here with me are uh, part, like the participants of the team that help us make this research possible. So Anita Sarma from Oregon State University, Daniel Izquierdo from Peturgia, Marian Gizani from, the, from Oregon State University as well, and Georg Gilling, who was also part of the team, but is not here with us today, but also an, a crucial part of this research team. And lastly, myself, Crystal de Cuevas, from the Apache Silver Foundation as a VP of Diversity and Inclusion. So let me introduce you to what motivates us to do the research that we're going to be presenting to you today. So in 2019, when the Diversity and Inclusion Committee was formed, we defined short-term uh, goals, medium-term goals, as well as long-term goals. So in the short-term goals, we discussed that we wanted to gather scientific data that could help us study the current state of diversity and inclusion in the foundation, specifically in the, in the communities of our projects. We also said that we wanted to raise awareness about what are some of the uh, contribution barriers that some people face when they want to participate in the projects, as well as find any indicators of things that might help us track over time to measure progress year over year. On the medium term goals, we wanted to have a participation baseline, understand where we are today based in the metrics that we defined, as well as to create a toolkit that will help projects identify ways to smooth the contribution barriers for their projects. And lastly, we want to, like, little by little, become a trusted partner for each of the projects at the Apache Silver Foundation to address these contribution barriers, as well as becoming more inclusive and diverse in their communities. So as part of this research, we actually drove three different efforts that have taken a year to complete. And these three efforts are uh, like are part of complementing each other to get a deeper dive into the re into the insights that we have been getting from one another. So the first effort that we launched was a community survey that you might remember uh, launched in December last year, and that I am to give us that baseline that we were discussing previously. After the community survey, we we decide we defined a few hypotheses that we wanted to test through interviews. These interviews were just another avenue to deep dive into some of the, these hypotheses and find more information about them. And lastly, we are currently moving into the quantitative analysis that will help us understand the activity in some of the projects to tie back to some of the insights that we got from the previous efforts. So after each of these three efforts were completed, we are we started to see some trends on the insights that we got from this uh, investigation. The top insights that we got are here in the screen. I'm gonna walk you through, through them. The first one is that the typical Apache Solar Foundation contributor is a male that is fluent in English or proficient in English. It's highly educated and also has time to volunteer. So these attributes is what make the baseline of our contributors at the foundation. The second insight is that the top challenge types, and we will hear more about this as Marion and Anita walk us through the research, are within three main types or topics. First one is the contributor background. In this category, we find things, uh, we find dimensions such as the language that the contributor speaks, the culture, how technical uh, they are, or how technical is their expertise. And then we have technical hurdles. Technical hurdles refer more to the project, the architecture, the technologies that are used to contribute to them. And lastly, communication. Communication styles, processes, et cetera. And lastly, one, of the, one very interesting insight that we got is that challenge experienced by minorities are not only present when someone starts contributing or are new contributors, they persist as they evolve in the contributor funnel, they become committers or part of the PMC, they is still true. All right. 
So from these three insights that we, we saw, we have three pre preliminary recommendations that can help ease them. The first one is to document a bachelor foundation and project specific policies and expectations. It is true that some projects already do this, but there's also others that have the opportunity to do this in a more clear way and accessible to everyone. A second recommendation is to streamline contribution and decision making processes. So this will help understand along with the clear documented expectations, what are the processes that a newcomer should follow, as well as creating safe space for the current for the people currently contributing. And lastly, is to create accessible resources for technical contributions, such as documentation, setting up the contribution environment, etc. All right, so with this, I am going to pass it to Daniel, who's going to share with us the phase one of the survey. Sure. So um, uh, the survey was, uh, well, we just started to discuss about the survey uh, in October 2019, where we had the survey design, and, and this was released to the community for further discussion uh, in the following months and so on. So we have this community feedback in, in the next two months. Uh, so as, as, uh, as uh, Gris mentioned, we had the release of the, of the survey, as probably you will remember, by the end of the year, of the last year. So we had in these two months really uh, fruitful and interesting community feedback with open discussions and comments and concerns, and et cetera, et cetera. And then we started the data collection um, in, at the end of the last year, beginning of of, of, of this year in 2020. Um, we have a bunch of emails that were sent mainly uh, to the uh, committers mailing list. Um, well, we we kept asking, probably you remember as well, we kept asking to, to have a, uh, more answers and so on. And then we had the opportunity to to uh, to, to attract more more interaction in standing at the at the booth in, in Postem that I, uh, so thank you, Sharon, for your time there as well. And we were we were working there together. Um, this was the deadline extended till till the end of February. So that was the time where where we close um, uh, the survey. The survey is split into six main areas. Uh, you can see at the bottom a long URL. So we will share the slides with all of you. So this is already publicly available in the Confluence uh, Apache site. Um, the six main areas are, as you can see, contributor role and tenure, motivation, availability of protocols or and guidelines. Uh, support for newcomers, diversity and inclusion, and then uh, wrap up session uh, section where we ask for uh, specific um, if, if any of you have a specific interest to to follow up with us. On the right, you can see uh, an example of the website that we uh, that we produce for for the survey. And then again, at the at the bottom, you can see the URL where you have in a, in the wiki the all of the questions. So then we can we can reproduce uh, part of the analysis. The survey is based on, on different inputs. One of them is, of course, the, the survey that was run by, by Saran in 2016. So part of that feedback and, 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 and questions we had integrated into this, into this new version, and then some others as, um, uh, coming from OpenStack, the Chaos community, and some others. Um, the process, uh, this couple of months, uh, was based on a couple of internal iterations, followed each of them by feedback process. This was done in uh, Google Docs. Um, we asked for public feedback, uh, looking for uh, for input in the in, in different mailing lists. So we had the specific uh, comments by the people. We had discussions and so on. Um, we had well, the usual voting and veto process followed by uh, by the PMC. Um, well, all of this is we are sharing all of this with you because uh, we want this to be reproducible in the in the future. So then you have all of this information, the process, documentation, all of the questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we had a, we reached a total of uh, 624 respon responses, which is around 9% of response rate based on a total community size of committers of 7,000. Yeah, so these are more or less the numbers we open. It's true that we open the, uh, the the survey to anyone that even participated in the community, but the main focus uh, initially was uh, were the commuters. Now, uh, Anita, your turn. All right, thank you, Daniel. So when we got the survey results for the analysis, we kind of focused on three main dimensions. 
One is demographics, you know, like the age, gender, English fluency, and still as background culture, like where they grew up, uh, participants, and where they are working now. Uh, socioeconomic status, which includes their education background, whether they are paid or unpaid, that's what compensation means here, and how much time do they have volunteered in a weekly basis. We also looked at the experiences in ASF itself, like the tenure, uh, whether they had mentors, and what kind of challenges they might be facing and how many challenges they're facing. We specifically looked at these three dimensions as uh, analysis lenses because we wanted to kind of um, look into barriers and challenges in open source and past research has said this is something useful. So going into the survey results, um, as Gris had kind of alluded to it, um, the majority respondents kind of fit into this average ASF contributor. If you look at the demographics, this is a 40 years old man who is confident in English and has been born and lives in the USA. Um, they have a bachelor's degree. They are working uh, as a volunteer and they have one to two hours per week to do that. They have been in the community for about five years. Uh, didn't have a mentor when they started and they're doing pretty well now. They're not facing any challenges, right? So this is kind of the broad view of your typical ASF contributor. So next few slides, we kind of go deeper into these different dimensions. The first thing, if you look at uh, the slide, if you uh, look at the pie chart at the bottom is, you know, what is the effect of formal education? And we found majority, 57% who had some kind of a graduate degree, either a master's or a PhD. And another 32 or like say 33% who had some college bachelor's degree. And only about 10.5 without any college education. If I can draw your attention to the bar charts, where um, purple means they are unpaid and it goes all the way to green, which is fully paid. So if you just look at the, you know, eyeball the, the bar charts here, those who had no college education seems to be more volunteers and, and there seems to be a trend about that. So what we wanted to do is like, you know, what is the effect of formal education on being compensated while working ASF? We ran a chi-square test to see if these differences we are seeing are actually significant at the level of 0.05, and we did find such a significance. So yes, seems like education does impact compensation. So what might be happening, what we are thinking might be happening is those who do not have formal education without any college might be volunteering at ASF to you know, build their skills, build their careers. But we have a very short percentage, only 10.5 percentage of these people who are our contributor pool now. The question to the community then is, you know, how do you attract volunteers who have no college education to broaden the base and also, you know, help people, you know, reach their career goals? Next slide, Daniel. Next question was kind of looking at the demographics was, you know, what is the effect of English fluency on challenges? Looking at the pie chart again, about 80% of the respondents are kind of at least confident in English fluency. 13.1 thinks that average and about 7% who are uncomfortable. Looking at the bar chart again, those who are uncomfortable or have average fluency do seem to be facing more challenges. And again, this difference is statistically significant. So the question to the community then comes back is, you know, what can we do to lower the language barrier that exists especially since all discussions and every communication in ASF is happening via English. So what can we do to broaden our base again? Next slide. Then comes the effect of gender. Not surprisingly, about 89% of our respondents um, are identified as men, 4.6 as women, and a short percentage, about 6%, where we can't constitute them as others. These were people who did not want to disclose their gender or prefer to self-describe. Um, and if you look at the challenges faced, there seems to be a trend again. Men seem to be facing less challenges than women, and these differences are statistically significant. So the question again comes out is, what can we do to reduce these barriers? And we'll go a little bit into deeper uh, when Mariam presents about what these challenges are that might be occurring. Um, this is the last of our bar chart slides, and here what we wanted to do was like, you know, challenges exist, but does having a mentor actually help? So our chart shows here, the pie chart on the bottom, that a large majority, 62%, did not have a mentor when they joined. 
whereas 36% had a mentor. And we have this little gray sliver that is about eight, 18 participants who have not made a contribution yet. So when we came into the, uh, the research, we thought you know, having a mentor would be something that will lead to lower challenges. But the results are kind of opposite. Seems like those who have had mentors have faced slightly more challenges. The results are not statistically significant, but this is counterintuitive and does bring to the you know mind questions like you know why is mentoring actually not helping uh, reduce challenges? Is it because those who are actively seeking out mentors are those who face challenges? Are those who are underrepresented and face you know uh, additional hurdles? Are they the re people looking for mentors, or is you know mentoring not really helpful? Like is it mentoring for projects? Mentoring for individuals? What is the role of mentors in ASF and what could be done to actually reduce these challenges? Next slide, please. So just as a recap of what we talked about, so education did impact compensation. Those in minorities face more challenges. Uh, English fluency, gender effects, mentor not so much. We also did a segmented analysis of men who said they're facing challenges to see if there was any demographic differences, but we couldn't find anything. We also looked at a segmented analysis of those who had moved countries when they grew up, but again, nothing to report. So I'm going to hand it over to Mariam now, who's going to go deeper into this deeper dive follow on of survey respondents and the challenges. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so our phase two was about the interviews. Um, so the objective here was mainly to identify what are these challenges that ASF contributors are facing. And from the survey, we had 221 contributors uh, report that they face at least a few challenges and they described their challenges in an open-ended question. But we wanted to dive deeper into this. So we followed up with interviews. We did 19 interviews from uh, June to September, 2020. And these interviews were of two types. So we had follow-up interviews with contributors that did respond to the survey. Um, and we followed up with uh, contributors that were within the gender minority group, uh, those that were within language minority group, and also contributors who identified as men and reported facing at least a few challenges. In addition to this, we also added additional interviews with people that were not part of the survey. So these are contributors who left the community and newcomers who are interning uh, with ASF. So after uh, running these interviews, we did multiple rounds of qualitative analysis of both the interviews and the survey responses. And we ended up finding 12 categories of challenges. So these categories, each one of them um, comprises of subsequent subcategories and subsequent challenges. So if we look into the middle graph, the tree diagram over there, uh, we can see the full um, image of the categories and challenges. Out of those, uh, six categories were already found in academia uh, in other open source projects uh, and were linked to challenges for newcomers coming in and six others were specific to ASL. The red dot in that like tree diagram uh, represents the ones that were specific to ASL. So if we look into this flow chart over here, um, we can see that the top part, which is um, in red, um, we can see that, that was the, those were the categories that were specific to ASL. And here we see that communication comes up uh, quite a few times. Uh, we also see process and geolocation as categories of challenges. From the challenges that were found in literature, but also um, ended up being also in the ASF data, we can see uh, the contributor's background, we can see the technical hurdles, documentation problems, etc. cetera. Uh, in these challenges, um, what we found about them is that the interrepresented groups tend to continue facing these challenges even after becoming experienced. So moving on to the next slide. So now let's take a look into a specific category. Um, so for example, the technical hurdles. In this category, we found three uh, subcategories. 
um, hurdles associated with this change request, hurdles associated with uh, the code architecture, and ones associated with local environment setup. So let's take an example of um, the, the change request hurdles. Uh, quite a few people mentioned uh, the delay to get contribution accepted or reviewed, and also the fact of getting a contribution accepted was quite hard. For instance, um, one of the participants mentioned this, I had the difficulty to understand project guidelines for accepting code changes. Some remarks indicated that style guidelines were important, yet large refactorings were shunned. Another contributor uh, mentioned this by saying, it was hard to convince the project committers in my decision and why they should have accepted my code. Moving on to another challenge category. Um, and this was one of the challenges that was um, specific to ASF. And this was the communication category, which um, included the style of communication, the tools used for communicating, and also interaction hurdles. So for the style of communication, uh, the main thing that was reported was the use of slang, irony, and technical discussions. Uh, for instance, um, one contributor mentioned uh, some people use more idiomatic expressions when expressing their feelings, for example, which is hardly understandable or misleading to non-native speakers. Another subcategory of the communication hurdles was the um, challenges related to interaction. For instance, uh, conflicting views uh, were mainly reported in different ways of viewing the project, the vision of the project or its architecture. Um, for instance, technical disputes over architectural direction of a project. Another um, challenge that was mentioned was about the overwhelming interaction. Uh, and for this, we have um, some contributors uh, mentioning that also very hard for an underrepresented newcomer or coder to catch up with a heated discussion with the heated discussions on the member list. I was happy being a committer, but once I saw all the member discussions in the list, I was overwhelmed. I have never commented on the members list for this reason. Um, so this was an overview of the challenges that we found in the surveys and also the interviews. And I'll hand it over to Daniel with a quantitative analysis. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of the work up to now. So the quantitative analysis is, is a thing that is happening next. Um, we are focusing on initially on 12 projects that are the ones that you have listed here, Airflow being Cassandra, Couch TV, and, and others. And these were listed by uh, survey answers. So we were aggregating them and counting uh, the number of times that they appeared and so on. So these are the, the most um uh, the most mentioned once and again in the in the in the analysis in the survey um the the goal of of, of this analysis of the quantitative analysis is to bring some certain understanding about the uh, gender diversity that we have in the community for all of these projects um of course as a limitation we are we are going to use a specific uh, apis and so on that will provide that gender based on the first name and this means that this is first the only attribute that we will analyze in an automated way. And second, this is uh, limited to a binary gender. So the goal here is not to be uh, any means, let's say, is uh, really uh, concrete or specific, but to bring certain starting point for, for further discussion in the community. As uh, limitations, uh, well, I just mentioned that the, these are related to the binary results of the gender and, of course, the heuristics and how to split the names and, and look for the first name and so on. It's uh, based on previous experiences. It's, it's harder, for instance, to, to deal with uh, names coming from Asia than Western names that typically APIs are working uh, a bit better. There are some specific uh, academic studies and so on that we we can mention later if needed. So the idea is to give this a uh, quick overview and current status of the diversity in this project. So that we have uh, this, this starting point. Um, as, as I mentioned, this analysis is not intended to be, let's say, exhaustive by, by any means. So we are focusing on certain projects, those that were detailed by the, by the community itself. And then we go through uh, the usual data sources as 
uh, Git repositories, uh, pull requests, Jira issues, or Baxilla. So we need to check the data that it's available and check what, what we have. Um, the output itself is a, is a dashboard that will where we'll aggregate all of the information and we'll we'll aggregate at the level of project. So then we we don't work at the level of individuals. Our goal is not to have a specific manual data cleaning, but to bring um, those numbers as this starting point for for discussion. You can see at the very bottom one example of, of a dashboard with uh, some tables, a pie chart. So this is the kind of information that we have at, at the end. Um, so these are the uh, six main areas for the quantitative analysis. And then finally, as a summary for, for the talk, so uh, as, as, a, as a reminder, so uh, as main insights, so we, we, we've we seen that the, the average persona, a typical ASF contributor is a male with English proficient, highly educated, at least bachelor, and with time to volunteer from one to two hours. Uh, there are uh, three main top challenges, as uh, Chris mentioned, uh, the contributor background, uh, technical hurdles, as we were discussing specifically in one of the interview um, interview slides, and then uh, communication. Um, and finally, uh, another insight is uh, that we've seen is that challenges experienced by minorities when they when they join the community, they they exist, they persist even after they become uh, they, they reach certain experience, right? So this is this is an interesting insight. Um, in terms of uh, recommendations. We have uh, a certain improvement about the project policies and expectations in each of, of the projects of the of the ASF. Uh, we've seen that each of the projects at the ASF they have their own um, uh, decision making process. Even when there is a, a, a general umbrella or a general uh, generic lines about how to proceed, there are certain uh, processes and so on that they are not clear. And for this, another recommendation is to create accessible resources for technical contributions, documentation in general, how the decision making process works, and, and other similar ones. Um, just to mention, as uh, one of the outputs of the project, we, we had uh, a few months ago uh, a readout of the survey that uh, we can share um, later with you in the chat and, and others. Um, and then we'll have from these, these specific uh, interviews and um, quantitative analysis, another presentation plus a final report, which is the, the specific out of the output, output of, the, of the project. So um, I don't know, Mariam, Anita, Gris, if you have any other comment or so, if not, we can go to the questions. Anita, may I just like to thank all of our uh, participants. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I would just like to thank all of our participants, survey, as well as interviews who really gave us the time and effort, as well as Grace and everyone at ASF for, you know, helping us along the way when we got through. Thank you, Anita. So, I, I also refer... So, Daniel, in the chat... Uh, before we, we come up to the questions, I wanted to add that the diversity and inclusion uh, effort started last year. I've seen that in the poll section here, a lot of the attendees are new to ApacheCon and also are users of the Apache software uh, projects, not necessarily part of the foundation. So I wanted to give a little bit of context that last year was when we for, like, formed the diversity and inclusion committee. And ever since we have been creating initiatives like this, but we also have other initiatives like the outreach programs. And there is opportunity for us to create more tools and more projects to help projects become more diverse and inclusive. So if you are interested, uh, you can join the conversation at dev at diversity .org. And now for questions. So there is there is one one question by Lawrence uh, about how we came back with the with the clusters and so on. So I assume Lawrence that you mean do you mean about the uh, the experiences and challenges for each of the so the three diagram that we presented? Uh, I think from the chat maybe maybe I can talk about he is referring to the readout. Seems like Lawrence. 
and where we had talked about the cluster analysis to kind of find out what is the majority profile. Mm -hmm. So those are more deeper answers which we didn't go into here because mm -hmm. then we looked at, you know, who is the face of ASF is we did some cluster analysis so we know statistically, you know, what our main face was. So I'm happy to talk to you more about how we came up with those clusters, but we found like one big cluster that was, you know, North America and the things we sec said, the second cluster was, you know, uh, bachelor's degree and from Germany. So Germany was the second biggest uh, country that we found our participants to come from in the survey. Right. Do we have any other questions? No comments, questions. <laughs> so how surprised were you with the results? Maybe Greece, this is a good question for you. <laughs> uh, I think like more than, than surprised, I think it, it has been very insightful to have had the interviews and have that very good analysis on the challenges type because we can start to separate technical challenges from kind of like social interaction cha uh, challenges and we can have more concrete plans to address both. I think that that is a very positive outcome from this research. And I think like it's also a good way to achieve one of our short term goals, which was put scientific data behind the current baseline and not just like, you know, we we anecdotally know that the profile of the contributors at the ASF are male, uh, familiar with English and all of that. We already knew it, but we wanted to, to get that data in the scientific approach to that. So I think like more than surprises, it has been very good insights and actionable too. Right. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in, in other uh, maybe maybe Anita or Marian, you can say, but I remember that we were looking at the at the numbers and so on, and we were surprised. We were surprised about how uh, highly uh, the, the, how many people are with bachelor or PhD or masters and so on. So that was an interesting approach, and 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 with this, the relation with with the compensation or not in, in the community was one of the results. Right. To me, that was the two major things that was different or surprising was amount of you know people with college education as well as higher education really and the amount of people who are actually being paid uh, as employees who responded so and that kind of um, when we go much deeper into challenges when we put our report did affect the incubation process and the communication processes so this is a new dynamics coming from an academic perspective that asf is front of with the hybrid model that you have vendors and companies and what that means to get the consensus done, what that means about how fast things can move, what that means for competition um, that are from closed sources. So that's kind of bringing a very new dynamics into this whole um, you know, open source itself. Hmm. Uh, there is there is another question about uh, if we look by EID, if we look at any uh, at location, I, I understand that this is geographical location as part of our analysis. Uh, maybe Anita, you can go. I can. Yes. I can take uh, a. So we did look at it. Um, go yeah. go ahead. Yes. With it. I just I just wanted to say that in the location piece, we actually took a very interesting approach with the cultural background and location background. But Anita can tell us more. Right. So just a basic thing. We had the location, and Daniel has put in the question. So which which country you are in? A majority were from North America, followed by Western Europe. Germany was kind of the bigger, a bigger uh, thing. Um, non, um, like typical suspects, Brazil was uh, high enough. Uh, but instead of looking at, as as Chris mentioned, just from the countries, we tried to find out people who were moving countries, like someone who was born in, um, you know. Um, we had some people who were in the US, but now in France. We had some people, a lot of people who were from India or China, but now in the US. Um, we took this new perspective because what we wanted to do was like, you know, um, culture plays a role in how we communicate, how we reach decisions, how we, you know, talk about decision making. So we wanted to take that perspective and, and see if we could find anything. 
But just looking at the countryside, like, you know, X country to Y country did not help us. So what we want to do, like help us in the sense we didn't get any different, um, like significant differences in the challenges faced. But I think what would be more interesting, and that's something we plan to do, is kind of do it on a continent basis or like a cultural basis. So, you know, from South America to North America or maybe Western Europe is similar to Northern America, but kind of looking at Asia to Europe or like a little broader analysis, more based on culture than just the country of origin. So that's something we want to do in the future. Yeah, so we, I think we have five more extra minutes for questions. Okay. Um, um, Robert is saying uh, communication challenges and actions are similar to the ones we found when we tried to scale up from the early days. Uh, I don't know who can answer that. So, uh, yeah, it seems like it might be because one of the things we are finding is because the policies, the ASF policies are, are, are kind of philosophical not operationalized really maybe so as you know and you're getting new people the same growing up challenges might be there because new people are trying to figure out what is the asfa mm -hmm. yeah. okay. so. <laughs> alan is saying maybe Chris, you can answer that <laughs> what would be one thing that you would do for the pnc sure so i think like documenting expectations and contribution pieces will be the one thing just because the nature of the apache way is to just have guidelines but let projects implement them the best way for each of the communities i think like this independence is very it's very unique it's very good it works and also provides a little bit of like confusion as of how to progress to become part of the of the commuter community and then part of the pmc so I have I have seen a few projects that actually do this very well and they let, like minimize that confusion. So I will say that. And if your project already do it, just also another another good tool that I have seen there is uh, project based surveys. So it helps you understand what your project is missing to become more more inclusive and we're not. And I know like this might sound a little bit repetitive from the survey we meet but the main difference is the survey we made was very focused on commuters and contributors so a more user in project level survey can help you find if you need or if you have a gap on documentation or perhaps on contribution practices so those will be my two recommendations clear guidelines that are documented and if you want to explore further a survey and projects like Apache Airflow have have done a very good job with this survey. Okay, so only three minutes. So uh, as a call to action, probably is if uh, you are interested in, in in sharing more insights from your side or, or providing some pointers and so on, so you can join the uh, development mailing list for the DNI group. Um, and we are all here. You have uh, we are in the Slack channel in Apache, and so we are around. Yes, let us know if you have any comment, concern, extra questions. So Robert has a good question, right over here. You can find the voices by analyzing the commit records. Maybe even if it's a PR-based thing, who's actually talking on the PR? So that would be something to also see. Like you know, is it is it really a core? few people who are getting hurt and the rest of the community is in that project is not getting hurt. So that's why like going deeper into a project based analysis can highlight much more um, like, you know, uh, nuanced or um, specific problems that individual projects can face instead of the larger ASF. Uh, so that's something to also look at. Yeah. So I think this is all for today. Uh one minute left. So just to thank you all again for your uh, time here with us. Thank you for Anita, Maria, and Gris for your uh, all of the hard work. And um, let's keep working. Thank you. Remember, if you want to learn more, subscribe to the dev at diversity.apache.org uh, mailing list. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Um, are we just hanging out here for questions or what's the... Do we guess? We should leave. I guess if there's nobody left, then we can just leave. There's only there are nine, ten people here, but officially it's over, I guess. But I believe Sharon said you can hang out here if you want to ask some questions. Oh, yeah. Um, so Robert had mentioned um, um, looking at the documents. So I don't know if we can save the chat here. It might be useful to save the chat so we can look at these questions later. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was in the chat. I was actually going to say that in terms of the documentation, just be written by a few of us. I think like one of the root causes there is that also documentation contribution isn't really recognized equally as a tech contribution. So it could yeah. be like a chicken egg problem there where if you don't recognize that type of contribution or you don't make it part of, you know, like your release kind of like process mm -hmm. to write documentation, this is never going to be a gap that you can really address. So I think like there, there are two areas where you can make this part of a when somebody sends like a, a PR, ask to have comprehensive documentation about the feature or contribution, and also encourage participation from technical writers by recognizing documentation, website, design, other type of contributions. I think that's a great point, Chris. And one of the uh, slices of research I'm trying to look at now is how to recognize non-code contributions, right? So uh, mentoring is also an important part, and especially for those who are underrepresented, you know, you have only so much time in your volunteering time, especially. So, you know, if you go for doing mentoring or you know, documentation or non-code related um, contributions, then your reputation in this uh, community is not seen or you're not recognized. So, but without that, you know, your community is not as healthy. So we are looking at ways that how to recognize these kind of non-code contributions, some kind of karma points and things like that, so that you know projects can start to increase that. Because what research has shown that um, you know if you have these ways of recognizing just not diverse contributions, you are likely to get more contributors and diverse contributors to the project. So that can have like a feedback, positive feedback loop. Yeah. So maybe maybe uh, so Robert was pointing to uh, perhaps a lack of diversity of voices. Robert, please correct me if I'm wrong. And he said that even today, when I read the foundation documents, I can guess who wrote what, which is quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 It is mentioning about the underrepresented uh, Africans in general, the SF community of projects. I'm just going to go and see if I can very quickly find our full ASF readout because there we had the country. So let me see mm -hmm. if I can quickly look at that. Yeah, and, get through. Uh, so let's because then we can just share that, right? So. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else is being talked about. Please, Daniel, you were so sad we deleted all those slides. <laughs> okay, okay. Now I was saying, and I'm trying to go back to our readout and see the slides we had for the countries. And you were like kind of sad, right? We removed it. Um, so do you have the ASAP readout, uh, Daniel? This is our, our slide deck, I believe. And uh, if you go to slide 89, yeah, let me check. Is there our, uh, where it is? I just put the link. Oh, sorry. I put the wrong one. No, that's not what I should have put. Uh, I know, okay. Here is the link we had. I can do the link, Anita. I think that's the one. Okay, so slide 89. If you go to Daniel, or maybe I can start sharing. I can share too. I have the power. Uh, actually, yeah, let me just share. Yeah. Let's see yeah. if you can see. So, yeah, um, 
Let me just present it. So this is kind of our uh, data of the countries. Whoops, mm -hmm. oh, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so mm -hmm. Germany eight point nine six, United States eight is forty seven percent. Uh, no, Africa we have Na Nairobi. Let's see where is Nairobi. I see from Morocco. Yeah, I don't, I don't see Nairobi here, but maybe. Yeah, me neither. Maybe it was. Maybe we didn't get anybody to actually answer the survey question. Yeah. Then, because mm -hmm. we have picked up count of culture, so nobody from Nairobi answered the survey then for us. Mm. So completely un. Recognize them. Yeah, there are four countries from Africa, as so you can see. Right. But again, this is not ASF view. These are the participants who responded to the yeah, survey, right? Yeah. So this is this is our pool of participants. Well, anyway, um, I'm afraid I have to leave. It's a bit late here. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, if there's no other questions, I think we'll hang up. I have a class to go to uh, in Thank five you. minutes. So. Thank you, everyone. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. For your comments. Bye.